We are delighted to introduce our next session, The Paradoxes of War, the Mindset of Peace. In the light of severe international developments and fiercer than ever debate surrounding conflict, human rights, and the instrument of war, the possibilities of either peaceful or predatory societies are at a fraught crossroads. How do we cultivate the mindset of peace amidst the paradoxes of war and the world today? Can we ever dream of peace? Or is it aggression instinct in a, a necessary session featuring prominent voices in the discourse of state, society, and self. May I please request the speakers to make their way on the stage as I introduce them one by one. Hans Jakob Friedlund is currently Norwegian ambassador to India. So His Excellency Hans Jakob Friedlund is currently the Norwegian ambassador to India. Prior to this, he was the director for UN policy in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Friedlund has served at Chile at the Norwegian mission to the European Union in Brussels and the Norwegian mission to the United Nations in New York and as a Norwegian representative to the Palestinian Authority. An economist by education, he has worked for 13 years in different capacities with conflict resolution in Africa. He has also served as the press spokesperson for international development in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We are delighted to welcome Mr. Hans Jakob Friedlund. I hope I got that right, sir. <laughs> Mr. Chandrakant Singh is a veteran of Bangladesh Liberation War in which he was wounded and received the Veer Chakra for his gallantry. He is now an acknowledged writer and speaker on military history and travel related subjects. In the past year, he has published two books, Cavalier in the Sky, the biography of Air Marshal Chandan Singh and Meghna River of a Victory, Meghna River of Victory, pardon, a definitive account of the defining battle of the Liberation War. We welcome you, sir. Ms. Shahin Anam is the Executive Director of Manushe Jono Foundation, MJF, a grant-making organization supporting human rights and governance work of organizations, approximately 250 of them in Bangladesh. She has worked for CARE Care Bangladesh, as the coordinator for their largest program and for the Ministry of Women's Affairs as project director for a gender equality project. She has also worked in international organizations such as UNDP and UNHCR, both in Bangladesh and abroad. We welcome you, ma'am. Mr. Walter J. Lindner is a German diplomat and professional musician. He is the current German ambassador to India. So we welcome His Excellency Walter J. Lindner onto stage. A unique combination, really. <laughs> Ms. Hannah Alice Peterson. Ms. Hannah Alice Peterson is the South Asian correspondent at the Guardian News and Media. We welcome you, ma'am, on stage to facilitate this discussion. Now that we have all our five stalwarts on stage, we hand over the stage to them and begin the session. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this panel today, uh, which is uh, about, yeah, well, I guess, war and peace, to uh, boil it down to its kind of raw elements. Um, this panel is happening against the backdrop of a terrible, brutal war that we are seeing play out uh, in Ukraine after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, which seemed to happen at the sort of imperialistic whims of Putin. And it unraveled a piece that I think many of us in Europe had taken for granted and made that sort of peace seem a lot more fragile and transient than I think a lot of us had appreciated. Um, and so we uh, so we've, we've got this kind of failure, I think, of many of the institutions that we thought were preserving peace in Europe, NATO, the UN. And we also got, you know, we're talking from South Asia, a place which, whilst India may not be at war, we have troops at the border uh, with China in the Himalayas. We've got uh, the kind of most militarized area in the world in Kashmir. We've got Afghanistan nearby, which, you know, the war may, there may have ended, but... I don't think anyone there would call what's happened uh, 
piece. And so today we've got a very interesting uh, range of panelists. Uh, we've got um, diplomats and those who've lived through war and seen it for themselves who can talk about uh, the kind of, I guess, you know, whether or not we feel that peace is something that has ever really been achieved or whether it has always been a kind of amorphous idea rather than something kind of we've ever fully been able to kind of realize. Um, and so this, the big question really here is kind of in the world today, is war a kind of permanent state of being or is peace something that on a geopolitical level, on an individual level that we can kind of work towards? Um, but before I kind of uh, get each of the panelists to sort of talk a little bit about their own experiences, I'm, I just want to ask particularly the two diplomats that we have here a question that is at the forefront of everybody's mind, which is, you know, are we on the brink of World War III? Um, so I think I will, first of all, hand this over to Walter, um, if you could answer this question. Thank you, Hannah. It's good that you asked me because Germany has caused the Second World War <laughs> and has caused great part of the First World War. So let's be careful when we talk about the Third World War because we know what it means. And coming to Russia, in the Second World War, Germany has killed almost 20 million Russian soldiers and civilians and Jewish people, of course. So we know how terrible a Nazi regime can be and how terrible a misused army can be. But we know also how terrible a war can be. So that's why whatever happens, we have to avoid a third world war, of course. And we, let's not use easily the phrase third world war because this might be an end for all of us. So let's not talk about such a perspective. We have a responsibility towards the international order, Ukraine, but also the rest of the mankind. We can't just easily play with the possibility of uh, a fully fledged war. Now, I'm an optimist, as diplomat, as politician, I'm an optimist, so there must be a solution for this terrible war. As Hannah has said, it was an aggression of a neighbor, peaceful neighbor, member of the United Nations, member and a democratic elected parliament, government, and it was an aggression which was announced as a maneuver because you might have seen that there were 150,000 troops around Ukraine in maneuver and put inside this just a maneuver and then two weeks later or one week later they they are now all in Ukraine uh, invading Ukraine and he said they are there as peacekeepers and they brought death and destructions so I'm an, as was said in the introduction, I'm an artist also. So being in such a place here breaks my heart because this is what we should do. We should concentrate on art, on artistic things, on creative things, and not on war. But nevertheless, if you switch on the television, you see the scenes when millions of people are running away from Putin, Putin's war. And thousands of people are dead and wounded, and the corridors are not respected. That's why we don't have other option. We lose humanity if we don't react, if we, if we let this happen and just switch to another channel and say, well, there are conflicts everywhere in the world. But this is a conflict which is happening right now. So I'm optimist, and, but I'm not sure whether we can, can trust uh, someone like Putin who has lied so often now in the last two, three weeks. Let's hope he's not lying this time and he is really serious in, in his steps towards a, a ceasefire. Okay. Hans, I will also turn this question over to you. Well, I think Walter answered uh, very carefully on the issue of uh, talking about the Third World War. We shouldn't do that first. Uh, but then the title is Paradox of War. And we see one aggressor who wants to impose his will on a peaceful neighbor who wants to expand his sphere of, of, um, of influence and power. Uh, a way of thinking that I thought we had buried century, actually a century ago, at, at least or, well, 70 years ago at the end of the Second World War. 
And then comes what what does I wish you, you mentioned uh, actually credibility. Who will trust a head of state who actually makes this type of statements? Uh, say military maneuver and then attacks. This has consequences for all contacts with this state. Uh, I've been uh, working on conflict resolution for 18 years in, in total in Africa and the Middle East. And one of the experiences is that when you first start a war, there that's a bottomless pit. We humans tend to say, it can not get worse than now. And yes, it can get worse and it will get worse. There's only way, one way to do about it, it's to, to stop the aggression. So, uh, and you have, uh, and when we come actually uh, about the security uh, situation is that NATO was an organization who was a, a, a loose federation of a number of, of countries. But this has changed the whole the feeling of insecurity in Europe. The whole debate about NATO has changed. No, before people believed in Putin, now they don't. In Norway, even the left-wing socialists, a party that was built on opposition, was founded in opposition to NATO, now is discussing to start accepting NATO membership. This has made a tremendous shift in Europe. So these are two, two other paradoxes I, will, uh, I would like to highlight now. Um, just to, um, sorry, uh, yes. Yeah. Shaheen, would you like to answer also, David? Well, uh, I just want to say uh, the topic of today's discussion is the paradox of war. And I really don't think there's any, the war is paradoxical. I think it is totally evil. It is designed and planned by some people sitting at the top to uh, annihilate, to take control over resources, to oppress and, and to kill thousands of people and make people refugees just to take power. So I just want to put it there. I also want to say something which might not be very political, politically correct here, but some of the Western countries have lost their moral authorities to stop war. What, what happened in Iraq? Why was Iraq that attack and other countries? What has happened in the Middle East? But that doesn't absolutely say that this wall is immoral. It's totally immoral. And please, I totally agree with you that we should not even mention the word third world war. Please, let's not. It's unthinkable. We cannot. War is not a last op is the last option. It should be no option. No option. Every time a man dies, it is a disgrace for humanity. A woman is ra raped. It's a shame for the whole humanity and a child is left orphaned, that is also a disgrace. So please let's have no tolerance for war anywhere in the world and no excuses. People, states make excuses. In 1971, Pakistan came up with the excuse that India is trying to divide Pakistan. That is why they went into war. That was not the case. They did not want the people of Pakistan. They did not want to give us uh, the people of East Pakistan autonomy. We wanted to live and have our lives in the way with our own culture, our own language and our own way of life and have our own leader who was elected as the prime minister of the whole country. And what, and what happened? They attacked us, attacked an unarmed people and waged a genocidal war over us in which 3 million people were killed, 200 women, 200,000 women were raped and 10 million refugees crossed into India. I just want to take two minutes to say that I was, a, I was 19 year old, so I'm almost 70, feeling super at 70, <laughs> but we stayed within and we fought the war from within. We helped our guerrillas, our uh, you know, liberation war uh, freedom fighters, and we stayed within the country's country and we helped it in any way we, we could because for us, it was an existential war. We wanted, we wanted to be what the way we dreamt of leading our lives. I just also want to say one thing that war has a woman's face. 
war affects women in very, very unique ways. And I want to relate a very small incident that I lived in Dhaka and every time a truck, army truck crossed my house, I would think it might stop. And the terror I felt is a terror that only a woman will un understand when she thinks that she might be sexually assaulted and abused. So that is where I am on, on, on what's happening here and the war and our experience. Thank you. I mean, one of the, thank you so much that's a, for sharing that story. Um, one of the terrible things about war is that it's often just seen as history repeating itself. We seem to fail every time to learn our lessons from conflict. I wondered if we could speak to Chantrakan about your thoughts on whether or not you think from your experiences of war, whether we have learned anything from these conflicts that could help us. Uh, every experience, we learn from every experience we go through in life. But I would like to sort of go back. Like her, my experience is 1971. She was 19, I was 29. I asked her, where were you then? Did you were a child. Like <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my perspective of war and peace is slightly different from the other panelists, except her, because I've seen both the things happening. We, won, we went to war, we won a war, but more importantly, as an Indian, what I'm proud of, we won the peace also. The Pakistanis surrendered on the 16th of December. On the 22nd of December, the Indian army handed over full authority to the Bangladeshi government in exile, led by Mr. Tajuddin Ali Ahmed. They arrived in Dhaka, and the keys to Dhaka and Bangladesh were handed over by the then victorious General General Sagat Singh to the Bangladesh government. And he told them, you are the governor's thing. We are not an occupation army. We are here to help you if you ask for help. Otherwise, this is your country, your people, you govern it. And we are privileged here to have with us General Sagat Singh's family. Will you stand up and please face the audience? Get up, Meghna. Ladies and gentlemen, the Americans went into Afghanistan, stayed 20 years or more. Same thing in Afghanistan, something in Syria and elsewhere. And they're still there. Here in seven days, India handed over the reins of the government to the country, to your country. And it's a fantastic country. I've been there several times. It's out of the world. And when we say the Americans went into a uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and how long they stayed? Mr. Ambassador, I want to ask you, are the Americans there in Germany or no? Are they in Norway or no? No, I'm glad. <laughs> As friends, but you know, that's okay. The army is there and the air forces are there. You know, see, these are fine points. The Europeans have a different attitude to our things. My dear lady, do you remember in 71? Do you remember in 71? Was there a single nation in Europe that stood up for Bangladesh? Except Russia. I think UK did. No. No. But they helped us in many ways. Not in uh, things. Your help started coming in. I will tell you on exact date. When public opinion veered to a thing. And that's as an artist and as a musician, you would be interested, Mr. Ambassador. On the 1st of August and 2nd of August, Ravi Shankar and George Harrison organized the concert for Bangladesh at the Madison Gardens. All the world's greatest musicians, Bob Dylan, the whole lot of them were there. That single concert, as you said yourself, myself, music changed the public opinion of the Western countries, particularly of the youth, not of the governments, but the youth turned around and became sympathetic towards Bangladesh. Every country has its own viewpoint catering for its own interest. The, I look at things in history. You know what Plato said? Only the dead have seen the end of war. And this is a, a next one that he said is applicable to Putin. A tyrant is always stirring some war or another 
in order that people may require a leader. All wars are fought for the sake of money. And what you said about the women, Plato said the same thing. Among the other honors and rewards of our young men can win for distinguished war service will be more frequent opportunities to sleep with women. This will give a pretext for ensuring that most children are born of that parent. It happened in the Second World War and it's happened in Vietnam and it's held elsewhere. The problem lies in the European concept of nation states. We in Asia always had civilizational states. As long as China and India were civilizational states, there were no problems. People went up and down. You had a huge area of uh, multi, where both the civilizations coexisted in Tibet and along the Himalayan belt and elsewhere along the Silk Route. It's only when we started borrowing this your, uh, Western con concept of nation states that we started having fixed hard boundaries, which you cannot cross without a passport. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just to bring it back to uh, Ukraine, I'm interested in what you think are the kind of the failures of peace, the failures of the institutions of peace that have led to this war happening? You know, you were referring um, to the Bangladesh concert, the Madison Square Garden concert. This was, I was 15 and this changed my life. I wouldn't be ambassador here if I wouldn't have this, heard this concert because it was Eric Clapton and the Beatles and George Harrison on one side and Ravi Shankar on the other side. And we thought this is such a mystical thing, such an incredible concert. I want to see where these people come from. And this was when I was 15 and I decided as a young hippie to come to India 40 years ago. That's why I was in India. And then I became diplomat and I said, I want to come back to India. So I wouldn't be here without this Bangladesh concert. If you, if you read my, my interviews, you will see this is a, was a decisive moment in my life, the 71 war. But I want to come back to the, you know, all these theories of what led Putin to do this. Was it, you, know, you said every, every war is money. No, this is also power. If you are, if you are mad or if you are power hungry, there are a lot of motives. The Nazis were ideologists, racists. So there are a lot of uh, uh, other reasons. I wonder if, 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 if those women and old, and old elderly and, and toddlers, which are now in the subways in Kiev and other places, shelting against Putin's bombs, if they would be happy, if, if they would hear talking about national, national state, you know, whatever happens in the past, and I'm self-critically saying the West didn't pay much attention or to, uh, enough attention to some of the conflicts around the globe, which is true. By the way, we said no to the Iraq war. It's not that we, we always said, yeah, uh, yes, we go Bush. No, we said no, Chirac and Putin and us. So it's not that this is an, a, a block which blindly follows something. No, we think about, we have our own brains and we think our moral categories. And in this category, what we see is a Putin, Putin's war. It's not the war of the Russians. We have excellent relationship as you have many soft spots with Russia, so do we, do we. I said, the German Nazis, they killed so many Russians. Now the reconciliation after the war between the Russian people and the German people is very, very dear to us because it shows that history can change and this hatred doesn't have to persist. So this is, we have a very soft spot. Germany would not be reunified without Gorbachev. And we had a very close relationship, but it came, it was Putin who out of different uh, uh, motivations attacked brutally a neighbor in 2022. It's not 71, it's 2022 when he attacked a neighbor. If, if, if this can be pardoned, if we just let him go away with this, who will be the next neighbor which will be attacked? Not by the Russians, but maybe by other big nations. Very many nations in this world have stronger neighbors or strong neighbors and border disputes. Now, shall we accept that just because the Putin sets an example that the next example will also be done like Putin, Putin kind of war? No, we can't because we lose all. Indian lose, Europe loses, South Africa loses, Africa loses, Latin America loses. We all lose. We have to 
hold him responsible because this is not a way to act in, the, in, in, in this year, 2022, to attack brutally, to bomb, to send people by millions of, of refugees. We can't accept this. We lose humanity. Every watcher of television loses humanity if we switch the channel and just say, whatever happens there is, is far away from us. No, it, 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 it deals with all our values as humans. Yeah, so I mean, it was my next question was going to be to Hans. So, you know, have we, with Putin's actions, moved back to where we were in 1939, where we have these kind of old fashioned territorial wars? Is that, you know, where history, is that where we are at now? Well, that's what you hoped we shouldn't be. We should be far behind that. And also because uh, we're talking about the idea of the nation state. It's actually, well, it, it was developed in Europe. And Europe was also one dissolving it. The European Union is a huge peace project. Few places in the world you can travel freely as in Europe. Uh, and I also have to remind, uh, just to, to stress the point of Ambassador Linder, is that actually it, you said the West did no, France and Germany were the strongest opponents and most vocal opponents to the American actions at that time. It was not Asia, it was Germany and France. So uh, it's about, uh, and we've been talking about the other word here, it's about mindset of peace. The first point of mindset of peace, that is respect of international law. There's a clear violation of international law, one of the most basic rights. Actually, you have the monopoly of, of, of armed forces and you should not use it for offensive purposes way if it's not mandated by the United Nations. So, uh, so they, we have to start there. If we, don't, if we don't respect international law, we're all in big trouble. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, no, I know where I implied that entire European countries were for the Iraq war. Uh, I just want to talk about the mindset of peace that yes, that is the number one, it's important, but that's not enough. N not, not doing enough to stop violent behavior, to uh, kind of shun this, uh, you know, very aggressive, uh, controlling, you know, behaviors that is developed. Uh, institutions within countries have to be built. There has to be education on building a harmonious society of not othering people, of people of differences, to accept differences. That is very important, not only to have a peaceful mind, but to work on actions that, and to interest and to work on action that, that promotes peace in the long term, because definitely it is a failure of institutions. You know, everywhere, if there is enough resistance from within, then leaders think twice of taking action. That is true, but yes, I know there are dictators who will not listen to anything and do it anyway. But even then, there must be some protest, some resistance from within that says, no, this is not acceptable. This is wrong. We cannot go into war. We cannot, you know, as you said, cross international borders. We, you know, there are some no-nos that has to be agreed. And for doing that, institutionals internally have to be built to promote peace and harmony within societies. So before I ask, uh, open it up to the floor for questions, I just had one question finally to ask to Walter, um, which he said, you know, you need to hold Russia to account. I mean, do you think that Putin can be held to account? Um, and also, you know, you've kind of quite publicly, uh, I guess, come to blows with the Russian ambassador. So if you could talk a little bit about sort of holding Russia to account on your own personal diplomatic level, and also whether or not you think the globe can hold Putin to account for what he's done. You see the difference between Europe and Russia, or even India and Russia, is we have press freedom. Now, I had a long interview a few days ago in, in an Indian newspaper, and yesterday the Russian um, uh, Shashed Affairs or, or the, the designated ambassador made a replique today. Fine, this is right. So the Indian public can read it and can decide, okay, is this narrative okay? Is this narrative okay? I wish people in Russia could do that because he has silenced, Putin has silenced during this war, all 
the critical voices in Russia. There's no more critical voice possible, in, be it from the, from the civil society or from the journalists. All the journalists were closing down. You have to do to follow the official propaganda. So that's the difference. I have no problem with, with the Russian ambassador in, in Delhi to say he's not agreeing with me. Fine, that's, that's democracy. I mean, let's every, let, let the, the, the readers in, in India are mature enough to, to, to see, okay, which, which narrative do we follow? But I would like to ask him, can also the people in Russia make, make, their, make their opposition public? So I have no problem with it. Um, so I'm just going to open it up to the floor for questions. Does anyone, would anyone like to ask a question? Um, I didn't. Do we have a uh, mics going around? Okay. Okay. Hi, this is addressed to Ambassador Lidna. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, the German position against Putin is not as strong as, for example, the British position. The Germany seems to be far too dependent on Russian energy to make its position clear in terms of supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine. So we see uh, some kind of, you know, you are one step behind the rest of uh, Western Europe in uh, helping the Ukrainians. With all due respect, sir, we are not one step behind. We are all in sync. All Europeans are in sync. Now, we have different histories. We have different economic situations, but we are all in sync. Germany, if you might have noticed, we have, we are now, you know, we have given up our our rule since 30, 40 years that we are not exporting arms into conflict zones. We gave it up and now we export to the Ukraines. We have stopped the pipeline, oil pipeline and gas pipeline, Nord Stream 2. So this is all. And, and then we are in, in, you know, in, the in the blockade of SWIFT and of economic and financial sanctions. We are, as Germany, we are the, the biggest economic powerhouse in Europe. So if we participate strongly in the, in the sanctions, it gives a very decisive teeth to the sanctions. Other countries have different ways to contribute. Every country contributes what, what they can, but we are all in sync. So I think Putin has had two fatal mistakes when he started his war of aggression. First, he thought the European voices and the Western voices in the world would not react in sync. And you, you see the United Nations, 141 nations condemning it very strongly. So he, he made us stronger. He, he, he brought us more together. And the second fatal mistake was, or a miscalculation was, that he, he thought he's coming to, he's invading his neighboring country and people would give up arms and would say, thank you, liberate us. No, they're running away. The civilians, they run away from him and the soldiers are fighting very heroically. So it, it, it was his mis uh, miscalculations. So in other words, the reaction of the Western world is very, very strong. And if you see in the G7, if you see in the European Union, in the NATO, we are all singing from one sheet. A uh, very good afternoon to the entire panel and to everyone here. Uh, I had a question uh, regarding the United Nations. Uh, we kind of saw the varied responses each country had to COVID-19 when it came to uh, what the UN was saying, what the WHO was advising and how well it was followed. So um, where do you think the, United Na the voice of the United Nations stands and how strong do you think it is uh, when it comes to standing against Putin? Uh, that's uh, an important question because the United Nations was established to actually manage wars or armed conflicts between nations. And as Russia is one of the P5 who has veto power, the only, you know, the only organ of the United Nations who can make decisive uh, binding decision is paralyzed. So this is also a crisis for, you know, for our international cooperation. 
uh, it's a, uh, the crisis we have to live it, but it goes to the core of the organization. And by the way, it shows the whole situation of Ukraine shows how outdated Security Council memberships are. India should be there. I mean, at the moment, they are there as non-permanent members. But India should be there. This is, uh, it, this is incredible. But no, this is reflecting the reality of 1946. And if you see the situation of Ukraine, one country, one single country with its veto can avoid a condemnation. And this country is Russia. And they had at the same, at this moment of February, even the presidency of the Security Council. So the system of United Nations has to be reformed and it has to start with the Security Council. We are very much on the same wavelength as India is because if, if people lose their faith into United Nations, then we are lost because it's the only international global organization which we have. So rather than saying, um, these are useless people. We have to improve it. We have to better it. And India is in the forefront to do that. And we have, and India has our full, full support. I agree with the His Excellency, the Ambassador. The Security Council, particularly, needs a complete overhaul. Uh, it tends to be well. It's outdated, as he said, uh, and it needs to be. The, the world has changed. I have an observation. Uh, I'm Naveen Chawla, the former Chief Election Commissioner of India. I have attended many sessions, but very few at the Jaipur Lit, uh, which are so frank. Uh, all of us need to ask a hundred questions. There isn't time for that. But I just want to congratulate the panelists for each in their own way sharing their country's histories uh, and for the German ambassador to be as frank and forthright. Um, I mean, beyond my expectation. So I just wanted to congratulate this panel and the moderator for moderating quite so well. Uh, it's been one of the best panels I've ever attended in Jaipur. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Hello, I'm Amita Nigam Sahai. And this question is addressed to the gentleman. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Uh, but in the context of the uh, 1971 war, where you talked about India as a, uh, taking forward the mission of peace in Bangladesh, uh, how would you relate that to India's stance today where we have China, you know, putting up all the troops at our border, and we are soft peddling, soft peddling with Putin for fear of uh, uh, him siding with China sometime in uh, the future. So where does moral authority? Thank you. I, right, right in the beginning, I made one thing very clear. I'm an ultra nationalist. The interest of my country comes first, everything else, is second. If I have to sleep with the devil, so be it. I agree with you that Putin is a tyrant. I read that out, what Plato had said about it. It's out of his self-interest. But when it comes to my country's interest, it is, that is paramount. Europeans have to learn to sort out their own affairs. No European, Western European country can turn around and honestly say, that when Russia made an approach to them to become a part of the European Union, it was spurned. It's out of peak that Putin has gone into saying, so far, no further. What business does NATO have to expand eastwards and put its weapons into Eastern Europe, which were under the things? Each country has its own perspective. And they are right to have it, because that is the only way when you meet like here, have a discourse in a civilized manner, we will find answers. I need to make a comment there. Because it's the country who decides if it wants to become a member of NATO or not. NATO has been very reluctant in actually increasing membership. 
So it's op it's a complete opposite of what is happening because Putin has now created an enormous fear in Europe. Is the wish to join has been become stronger among those not being members and being stronger among those being members. So it's uh, that, that that narrative is actually dangerous, I will say. I, I think Shaheen has a one point. That no, I explain. just I just want to say that we can't have double standards about which this war is good because for so and so reason, and that war is not fine because for so and so reason, the, and and that is the main problem. We really have to have a collective moral authority to say that war is no option because it just creates havoc in the lives of people. And I just want to give one example about conflicts that four years ago in Myanmar, the Rohingya people were driven out of their homes, murdered, raped, their houses raised to the ground and Bangladesh gave sanctuary to 1 million people and they're still in Bangladesh. Now, we, there has been protest, but all the countries are, many countries are trying to be friends with them, doing business with them. So, so the Myanmar Janta think it's fine, they can go on and do it. So with that kind of a mindset, I really think that peace is in peril in this, in this, you know, in this world, I'm sorry to say. So uh, I actually have a question which is directed to Europe and not to India. So um, as Europe, you are eager to welcome refugees from Ukraine, but why are you not uh, showing the same mindset against the refugees which are coming from Middle East? If you have seen um, the huge wave of refugees 2015, but Germany accepted more than 1 million from Syria and from other countries. Those were refugees coming across the Mediterranean Ocean. And we said, Chancellor Merkel said, yes, we can do it. We can integrate them. We can't integrate the whole world, but we open our doors and we distribute them in Europe. But, you know, it's, it's easier said than done to accept everyone who comes. So there are some criteria. So I think it's not a black and white thing that you say, why don't we accept the refugees? We do. Now on the Middle East policy, I think if you start this, this is a, a, another discussion. It goes very, very long, but as Germany, we have a very strong relationship towards Israel because of the second world war, because of Holocaust, because we killed 6 million Jews. As much as we are proud of, of the reconciliation between the Russians and the Germans, we are of course even more proud of the reconciliation and of the brotherhood now between the German and the Israeli people. We say never again, we say, um, let's always remember, let's not forget, and let's be on the side of Israel as a pact of solidarity because of what has happened in the German history with the Nazis. So that's a, a different topic, but believe you me, the refugees, to accept the refugees in, the, in 2015, um, was quite a big thing to do because we had to accept more than one million and we do so and at, at the moment we have already two and a half million people running away from Ukraine. People predict, the United Nations predict there might be un, uh, up to 10 million which run away not from an earthquake or from a pandemic but run away from Putin's war. 10 millions, as, as the general said, um, let the European sort this, the European sort this out. We, we have to deal with our problems. I understand every country lives in its own history, has its own neighbors, its own mentalities. So totally clear that India can decide whatever they want also in the Security Council. Of course, this is the right of every country. Think of your own interests. My point is only, it's in the own interest of every state in the world, to avoid a behavior, Putin-like behavior. So it's even in the interest of India, because if, if we remove all these moral barriers or, in, or international treaties, the UN Charter, and let um, a, 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 a man just out of power hunger or whatever motive he has, attack his neighbors, 
it has repercussions to all of us if we want it or if we don't want it. Maybe not now, maybe we don't see it. So that's why it might even be in the interest of states to see this is far away, but we have to put a stop on this. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, honestly, this was one of the best sessions I've attended. Uh, I have one question over here. Uh, whenever we try to talk that, you know what, Russia is doing something wrong, the side comes up with what aboutism that uh, what about Israel and Palestine at such a time how would the panel think a response would be is there no difference whatsoever or is there a very big difference very big difference between Russia and Ukraine and Israel and Palestine thank you uh, son that is the paradox of having one uniform policy and judging everything by one uniform thing that's where history comes in. You have to go back a little more into depth of the subject. You cannot apply what is good here is exactly good elsewhere. In our Indian tradition, we have something called Dui Videhi Videkto Dharma Pravuti Lakshno Nivruti Lakshnach, which means that there is a law, there is a boundary, but there are some things which are outside it, which cannot be judged by conventional law and wisdom. So the situation of Israel is a little different from what is happening in Ukraine. You cannot apply the same uh, yardsticks. Hans, would you like to just, having worked in the conflict? <laughs> it's, um, do we have, well, every conflict has its own characteristic. And that's also where you, we, we do have, actually we do have a moral compass and we do have a legal binding framework. We have international law. And that's that's the bottom line. We have to see what, how will you then, how is that complying with international law? Uh, in, the, in the case of, uh, of the Middle East, I, I spent five years there, you often get the question, are in favor of Israeli or Palestinians? It's sometimes it, the one way, sometimes it's another way. The bottom line, what will what is according to international law? And what is according to international human rights? We haven't succeeded, uh, the world hasn't succeeded there because we don't have the necessary means to implement the, 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 the provisions of international human uh, or international law. But if we, if we don't use that as our compass, we are really uh, bad off. Yeah. Can I just uh, have a last comment on? on those who were saying this is a, the best discussion which we had so far. My opinion is that diplomats have to be outspoken and you know, has to be transparent and not dealing you know, behind closed doors or whatever. So whatever you ask me, you get an authentic answer. So ask the colleagues in Delhi, you will do that. So I think this is important to have such a discussion. Before I came here, I know I decided, I, I was thinking in, in Delhi, can I go when we have this war waging on and we have these photos and this people suffering and dying every day, can I go to a literature festival? Because it looks like being in the in an ivory tower, you know, talking about the nice things in world while people are dying out there. But I thought, no, let's go there because, you know, first we have a panel on Ukraine and, and on war and peace. And second, you know, this is why it's so important to live because we have all this beauty. Let's be thankful that we have this beauty and we don't have to shelter in in, in, in subway stations. So sometimes we take things too, too much granted. So I thought it's good. I don't want to spoil the beautiful artistic atmosphere, but it's also good not to shut up the television channels and there might be a fatigue or not, not again the war. Let's stop this war. Let's do whatever can be done to stop this war because people as we sit here and discuss are dying. The older people, younger people dying, fleeing and, and you know, we have to stop this, and that's why I thought I should come here. I just, I just want to say that we have come a long way after the Second World War. You no, know, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it says every person has a right to a peaceful, 
life of security and well-being. That's a fundamental right of every human being. Please, let's leave a better world for our children and not think about war. War is evil in every way. Well, a fantastic note to end on. Thank you so much to my panelists for your candor and your in, in wonderful uh, and interesting opinions. Um, thank, and thank you to the floor for your great questions. Ladies and gentlemen, the paradoxes of war, the mindset of peace, already unofficially dubbed as one of the best sessions across the festival. So I think the, the speakers here deserve some felicitation from our end. So maybe please request all of you to accept a small token of our love and appreciation for that. Hans Jakob Friedland, Friedland Shahin Anam, Chandrakant Singh, and Walter J. Lindler in conversation with Hannah Alice Peterson. And just to add on to what was said in the end, yes, we're in a time of crisis and a time of war. And it is ever so important, especially in times like these, to have platforms for open and transparent discussions. This is like a war mala. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to all the speakers and all the audience members for this session for making this rather riveting, rewarding, and engaging. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.